Uh, let's move straight on into uh, our meeting, and I would like to introduce our speaker today. His name is Mike Ursa. I've known Mike for 10 or 15 years, and, and uh, he's a great guy, a good businessman, a good husband, good father, uh, works with a small group, so he's uh, a little bit busy. So y'all welcome Mike. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you guys something that's been very heavy on my heart for a long, long time. Um, but I'm going to ask James here. Um, I've got a card that I'm going to ask each of you guys to, to write some stuff on for me. So he's going to pass out a card. If you need a pen, he's got pens too. Um, but I want to share with you guys this concept of biblical manhood. Um, <laughs> look at our world today, right? How messed up everything is and and what's just upside down right everything is just crazy and you know you're you're only tolerant and accepting as long as you're not a Christian man right <laughs> then you're a bigot and all these horrible things and the world's just going upside down um, and it was in a uh, 2015 I was on a mission trip to Haiti and people say when you go to Haiti you either love it or you hate it and I hated it. <laughs> I hated being there. I hated everything about it. And I sat in my room and I asked Jesus, I'm like, what do you want? What, you know, if this isn't for me, if this isn't what you're calling me to do, what is it? And this stirring began to like start about like men, like working with men, helping men. I don't, I don't know healing, like I don't know what it is, but I just wanted to let Jesus kind of work in me on, on what he was doing. Um, what we're going to talk about today, seven years later, is what he's been doing uh, in me. And so I want to share with you guys uh, what I think Jesus is showing me. But first, what I want to ask you to do in these cards is take a minute, and I want to ask you guys to write down what do you think it means to be a man? Just a minute or two. What, whether it's ideas, goal, like, I don't, I don't care, because... What I want to do, without me tainting your opinion, I want to know what you think it means to be a man. Then I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to ask that you are either checking off those things, like, oh, yeah, he talked about this, he talked about that, or if, if there's questions that I bring up, then I would ask that you would also write those down so we can talk about it at the end. I'm here because I want to hear from you. This is the first time I'm presenting this information publicly, so... I want men that love Jesus to be able to share with me to say, this is a good thing, or hey, you're missing the mark. You know, I'm, I'm asking you to shoot holes in me. Um, so uh, that's what I'm going to ask. So I'm going to ask you to just take a minute to uh, write down what you think it means to define biblical masculinity. Hey, come on. <laughs> it's good to see you, buddy. Thanks, sir. Sorry. Please. Sorry. That's fine. Here, grab a card. I'm asking everybody to write down what they think um, it means to... Anywhere, yeah. Um, what, what you think it means to be a man. Biblical masculinity. I like seeing people writing. That's good. <laughs> Means you got a lot to say. I'm sure we could write forever. I'm going to give you another 30 seconds or so here.
So the stuff I'm going to share with you guys is stuff I believe Jesus is teaching me. But I don't want to communicate that I... I don't want you to think that I think that I've arrived. That everything that I'm going to share with you is something that I think I've already mastered. Right? Um, so I hope that I step on some of your toes. I hope I step on all your toes. I hope I upset every single person in here. I hope that you guys are challenged by the stuff that I say. But I also want you to know that I am myself. That I'm stepping on my own toes and the stuff that I'm writing, I'm like, yeah, I need to, I need to be that. I need to do this and that sort of thing. So, um, again, as you have more thoughts, write them down. If you have questions, if you have challenges, if you completely disagree with something that I say or do or put on here, I want to hear it, right? Um, I told, I think I told Bill earlier. Selfishly, I'm here for me. Right? Like normally we present here, and I'm going to present, but I want to hear from the group too. This means a lot to me. So. Uh, we're going to get cracking here. So why? Um, why me? Why, why this? Why is Jesus doing this to me? I grew up broken, right? Um, my, my home was a toxic, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive mess. I had no strong father figure. There was a da my dad was there, but he was not a man by any definition. Um, and he never <coughs> rose to that occasion. Um, so my experience was broken. I didn't have anybody. I didn't have any guidance. I didn't accept Christ until I was a senior in high school. Um, and so my journey was very difficult. It was very splintered. I, I got little pieces of masculinity from different people as I, as I grew in my relationship with Christ. Um, my burden is, is bringing healing to all men. I work in an industry where I work with people every day. I have, I've probably employed 5,000 people over my past 20 years. Right? That's... And I hear stories from everyone. When I talk to men, they are hurting and they're broken. When I talk to women, they're hurting and they're broken because of something that a man did to them. Right? We live in a broken world, and I have come to the conclusion that men don't know what it means to be a man. And so I thought, well, what does it mean to be a man? And so we, we talked about this. And then I've got two boys. Um, I want to teach them what I missed. I want to teach them what so many people that I see are missing. Um, it's been good for me. This is my hypothesis. If men knew exactly what it meant to be a man and strive towards it, their wounds could be healed, their families would be healed, their communities would be healed, their nation could be healed, and Jesus would be glorified. Right? Um, so that, that's my hypothesis. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. All right, so what I think this is, what I think being a true man is, biblically, is the pursuit of seven different virtues. And I'm going to talk to you about each one of those things and why I think it is. Um, these are ideals to strive towards, right? It's not like a checklist where you just do these things and poof, you're good. Um, these are ideals to which we all strive towards. This idea of stumble forward is something that's come up in conversations with me. It's this idea that comes in my mind of climbing a mountain where you're just keep going and sometimes you get knocked back. And as men, we have to just keep going. We have to keep stumbling forward. You're gonna screw up, you're gonna make mistakes. I'm making mistakes all the time, but we have to keep going. I think that's what Jesus is calling us to do. All right, so we're gonna get started. The first virtue is of course Christ. Right um, Now, these may not be virtues by the traditional sense of the word virtues, but you're going to understand these concepts, which I'm explaining here uh, in a minute. Um, Jesus was the only perfect man. Right? Um, <laughs> Jesus created us. He created man. Because he created us, he knows exactly how we were created to act. Right? He put true masculinity into us. And by the way, the only masculinity that isn't toxic is Christ, right? They talk about toxic masculinity all the time. Yeah, we're all toxic because we're all sinners, right? So let's point to True North, who's the only one who wasn't. Um, everything else that I talk about will be impossible without Christ. To do it right, to do it well, some other guys are going to be able to do it um, in little areas. Maybe we do some in little areas. But if you don't truly know Christ, if you're not pursuing him, if you don't have a real relationship with him, none of this is possible because the only true masculinity comes from Christ. So we start there, right? Um, that means being a true disciple of Christ, seeking to know him every day, building relationship with Christ every day, searching scripture, 
If you're not, if you don't know scripture, how do you know truth from falsehood? All the stuff that we hear in society today. Um, Jesus says, "If you love me, you'll obey my commandments." Right? If if you love Jesus and you're not obeying his commands, you're not doing what you're called to do as a man. Um, I say that scripture is the filter to interpret the world, not vice versa. So I see a lot of people who will take the Bible and they'll say, but my brother's gay. So the Bible can't be right or God can't disagree with it because I know my brother and I know his heart is good and he says he loves God and all that. No, it doesn't matter what your life experience is. It doesn't matter how bad that is. Bible is absolute truth. So we have to, as men, we have to look at the world through the lens of the Bible and interpret the world based on what the Bible teaches us, not vice versa, right? We have to as men, because if not, you're going to see the world through a distorted view. Obviously, we have to pray as men, right? The Bible teaches us to pray for wisdom. It teaches us to pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, for guidance, to pray without ceasing. We need to be praying for everything and in everything. Um, and as followers of Christ, we need to strive to walk in purity and holiness. Right? So it's, it's a difficult thing because we're going to screw up. Um, grace is not an excuse for sin. Right? We heard Paul talk about that. Um, the one thing that I think men get stuck on is when you screw up and then you screw up and then you screw up, um, we can beat ourselves up over it. And the thing is, when we hold ourselves to guilt that Jesus is already forgiven, like you're putting yourself in a place that's better than Jesus, right? Who are you to say you're still guilty when he says, no, you're clean? So one of my challenges to men is when you screw up, forgive yourself, ask for forgiveness, and move forward. Don't let yourself be tethered to false guilt. And this is that idea of stumbling forward. Keep clawing. Keep trying. Don't ever settle. Don't ever give up. Don't stop trying to, to break your sin habits. Don't stop trying to be more Christ-like. But don't let it hold you back either when you keep screwing up. All right. This is Christ, right? Um, I'm going to try to speed up here because, uh, again, I want to hear from you guys. Number two, pursue humility. Big, big deal, right? Humility is the opposite of pride. Uh, pride is the root of all evil, right? It's what Satan wanted. He wanted people to worship him. He wanted to be on top. He wanted to be in charge. Pride, right? And that's the root of everything we do because we focus on ourselves instead of what Jesus wants for us. We know that God hates pride, but it gives grace to the humble. Uh, we see that all throughout Scripture. When we think about ourselves first, we put ourselves above everyone else. We put ourselves above God because we say, I think I know better than God, which sounds stupid when we say it out loud, which is also a form of idolatry, right? Because you're putting yourself above God. Um, humility is being able to lay aside what we want or think and conforming to what God wants for us. Um, now, we talk about pursuing wisdom. Um, which the entire book of Proverbs is about, right? Pursue wisdom, we see that all over the place. Um, only the humble man can be wise because only the humble man is willing to accept instruction. So if you're not living, if you're not pursuing humility, if you think you know it all, if you think you're right all the time, that's not what Jesus has called us to be as men. Jesus was obviously the ultimate example of humility. We read about that in Philippians chapter 2, right? Where he became humble to the point of death. Um, even the death on the cross, right? Um, but humility allows us to grow. It allows us to listen to others. If I think I know it all, how many, we've all done this, right? We're in a conversation with somebody and you're just waiting for them to stop talking so you can say what you think you need to say, right? We've all been there. Someone, it's either uninteresting or you completely disagree and the words are just like Charlie Brown's parents until you can like get your point in. That's not humility. Humility is genuinely listening to others. Maybe they do have something valuable to say. Um, and it allows us to be molded by God into what he desires for us. You can't love your wife correctly unless you're being humble, right? If you think you know how to treat her, 
all the time, you're probably wrong if you're not listening to her. Um, many of us could say it's easy um, to say we would die for our wives, right? Oh, I'd go, you know, run in front of a car for her and all those sort of things. But would you live for her? Would you be willing to live in such a way that you're willing to change who you are to meet her needs and her wants? That's humility, right? Putting yourself aside, saying, nope, she's more important, right? Because that's what Christ has called us to be, right? That's humility. All right, number three, honor. Now, the way I define honor here is respecting others while being worthy of respect. Does that make sense? So we need to honor all people. People you don't like, you need to honor. People you like, you need to honor, right? And we could go down a whole list of people. Um, it's really hard to sometimes because the stuff that we can hear in the chatter on TV with all the politics and everything that's going on, I'm not saying you gotta like everybody. And I'm definitely not saying you need to agree with them. But I'm saying, we are called to honor people and treat people with respect because Jesus loves them all. And we are called to be representations of Jesus Christ. Right? So when we are not treating others with respect, we are not being the men that God's called us to be. Um, obviously, there are people you know, in authority that need to be honored. Right? That's biblical. Um, Romans 13 talks about that. Uh, honoring your parents. These are all things that we've read about in Scripture, but treating others with honor is a big, big deal. Your wife is the one person God called you to care for more than any other. If you're not honoring your wife, you are wrong. Does, the question is, if I, if I show this to your wife, would she say, yep, that's the how I feel by him? No. Right? That's, that's the secret. Um, do you go out of your way for her? Do you learn about her needs and change your behavior to meet her needs? Or do you just say, well, I do it that way. She should just deal with it. She should just endure it. Do you intentionally prioritize her over your friends, over your work, over your hobbies, activities, everything else? Um, and do you pursue her regularly? Are you actively pursuing her? This is how we show honor to her, right? How about your kids, right? Treating them with honor. Um, yelling at them is not honoring. Um, discipline coming from anger is abuse. That's not honoring. Abusing your children is not honoring them. True discipline comes from love, right? Hebrews 12 talks about that. So are we disciplining out of love or are we disciplining out of anger? One is showing honor, one is not. Genuinely listening to your kids, intentionally pursuing your children, getting to know them. I have a teenage daughter, and it is very difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult because she'll shut herself off in a room, and she won't talk, and it's hard to you know, get things out of her. And I have had to work to figure her out, to learn her, to try to pursue her, to try to build relationship with her. Um, that's our job as men. That's our job as fathers. And again, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm, I'm struggling through all this stuff too. But this is what Jesus is teaching me. Um, and as my kids tell me, don't turn everything into a lesson. You know, every time you're with them, Dad, it's not a lecture every time. Like, just, just hang out. I'm like, okay, so that's there. Um, honoring women. I think this is a problem even in the church. Does your presence make people feel safe? Or these women? Do, when women are around you, do they feel safe? Or do you make them uncomfortable? and the words that you say, and the things that you do. So some, some thoughts on that. Speaking to them with respect, they are not objects. They're not to be demeaned or belittled. Showing platonic care and respect, right? This is the things we always talked about, opening doors, carrying heavy things for them. You know, if there's a seat on the bus, let them sit down, you stand up, right? These are ways we show honor to women as men. This is our job. Um, don't touch women inappropriately. As a matter of fact, my recommendation is to allow women to initiate physical contact with you. If they want to give you a hug, let them do it. If not, then you can just say hi. Let them feel safe, right? Now, your wife, your kids, you hug your kids, that's fine, right? I'm talking about women in general. Um, a handshake at work, different, right? That's, that's fine. That's safe, right? Um, anything beyond that, I would say let them do that. Um, compliment them in a in a non-creepy way. If 
there's something. So I showed this to my daughter. She was looking over my shoulder when I was going through this. And she goes, oh, these are good. Like, this is good advice. So this is good. I've got my blessing of my teenage girl. Um, but what, you know, basically, my rule of thumb is when, when I see a woman make a change, she changes her hair, she changes her nails, you, know, you see something different, just compliment it. I don't care if you like it or not. It doesn't matter because like, usually I don't even, it's irrelevant to me. It's, it's, it's A or B, it's just two different things. I don't even know, right? Um, but if I have a girl at work that I say, hey, you change your hair, looks great. Just let them know you notice them. I'm not saying, ooh, I think you look super hot. Like that's completely inappropriate and creepy, right? You're not trying to be some pervert. Um, but I think so much has been distorted in how men should treat women that men are afraid to be kind to women. And I don't think that's what Jesus, Jesus wants us to be safe for them. And it's okay to compliment them in a way that doesn't creep them out, right? Um, I think that's important. And of course, the don't ever compliment or don't ever talk about pregnancy, weight, age, right? All those standards, that all falls under honor, right? You can embarrass them. As men, we are supposed to honor women. Now let's talk about being worthy of respect, right? We talked about respecting others. What does it mean to be worthy of respect? Starts with our words. So much of the Bible talks about our words and how the tongue is like the bridle of a ship or a small fire that can ignite you know, a whole forest. Um, I'm going to rattle off a whole list of things that I didn't put on here because it would have just jumbled up the screen. Do you use proper grammar? Do you mumble? Do you gossip or talk bad about others? Are you too quiet or are you obnoxiously too loud? Do you only talk about yourself and things that are interesting to you or do you talk about others? Do you overinflate yourself? and tear others down? Do you judge others easily and make inappropriate comments? Do you know when it's appropriate to stop and to start talking? Or do you just like to talk over people? Don't use vulgar language, including offensive jokes. That's scriptural. Don't lie. That's scriptural. Learn and use people's names. You know, in psychology, someone's name is the most important word in their language. So learn, if you're going to honor people and you want to be worthy of honor, learn. Always be intentional in your speech. The Bible talks about the guys who rattle off just random words and people just want them to shut up, right? Be intentional. Give a thoughtful response. Um, how about how you look, right? Your dress. Are you dressed appropriately, right? You know, when you're hunting deer and you need to smell like deer urine, that's appropriate, right? <laughs> But at night, if your wife wants to take you to a fancy dinner and you don't clean up and you smell, still smell like deer, that's a problem, right? That is not being worthy of respect. That is insulting to her. So figure it out. Wash your hands, get the grease off your nails, do whatever you got to do. Um, your hair, your clothes, all that stuff. How about your posture, right? This is all the stuff that we've heard. Standing up straight, not slouching, especially with the kids, with the cell phones. They're, I mean, they look like candy canes sometimes. It's a problem, right? Chest out, chin up, shoulders back, all that stuff, right? It matters. Hygiene, gentlemen, I talk to my kids and when all their friends are in middle school, I would have lectures with all their boys. I'm like, boys, you need to shower every day, you need to wear deodorant every day, I don't care what you think. That's what we do. As men, we don't want to be offensive to others, right? So brushing your teeth at least twice a day, using floss, there's these things called tongue scrapers. Most of the bacteria from bad breath will come from your tongue. So if, you, if you've got that issue, you know, they make these things called tongue scrapers, they're amazing. Maybe you need to carry mints and gum with you all the time. Don't smell like smoke. Don't, don't go to the bathroom and not wash your hands. That's not honoring people, right? You can get people sick. If you have a cough and you cough into your hand, it is not honoring people. Because if you have a cough, you're probably sick and your hand touches everything. I work in the food industry. People we talk about washing hands all the time because that's what everybody gets sick from what your hands touch. So wash your hands and get off my soapbox. Big deal. Jeez. Um, how about when you engage others? Right? Do you communicate thoughtfulness? Or do you communicate only thoughts to yourself? Are you being respectful in how you talk to others? And living with integrity is how you live with respect. If, being, if you're going to be someone who's going to be someone who's worthy of respect, live with integrity. Honor your commitments. You say you're going to be somewhere, show up on time. Honor your word. Stay faithful to your wife. Don't divorce your wife and leave your kids and your wife behind, right? That's selfish. That's not worthy of respect. And don't do stuff that makes her want to divorce you, right? 
we could talk all about that stuff. And then the Bible clearly talks about living above reproach, where there's not even a hint that something could be wrong, right? This is what Jesus calls us to do. All right, we're going to try to keep moving. Protection. We all know about this, guys. As men, God has created us to be protectors, right? Um, Adam was to keep and protect the garden. Husbands are to care for their wives as their own bodies. Men are created physically bigger than women, right? We have a natural aggression in us. That's what testosterone does. We're created to be soldiers. We're created to be fighters. We're created to be protectors. That's our job. The problem is people have slapped this toxic masculinity on, on aggression and testosterone, and, and society has essentially castrated men where men don't know how to act and do this stuff, right? The thing is, we have to, as men, we have to stand up against evil. That's our job. And if we are insecure in who we are as men, then we're going to be insecure in standing up. Oh, let someone else do it, right? What happened to Adam when Eve fell? What was Adam's first sin? Passivity. When she was dealing with the snake, he was right there next to her. And he didn't do a dang thing about it. He was passive. And how much of that has been traced through all of us, right? That's not the way God created us. And we have to be different. We have to stand up against evil. We have to protect everyone. Those under our care, like our families. But if I'm in a public place and I see a woman getting hurt, even if he's seven feet tall and 400 pounds, I'd rather take the beating than her. That's our job as men. We're called to be meek, right? Meekness, power under control. We're supposed to be dangerous, but we're supposed to be able to keep it in check, right? So there's two problems there. If you're not dangerous, that's a problem. If you don't know how to be dangerous, that's a problem. And if you don't know how to control it and you just violently fly off the handle and you're yelling and screaming and throwing stuff and hitting people, hitting maybe your wife and your kids, that's a problem. That's not what Jesus has called us to be. Um, Jordan Peterson, great guy, I'm a big fan. Um, he said that a good man is a dangerous man who voluntarily has that under control, <coughs> right? Um, as men, it is our job to protect in bad situations, but if you are using violence against the innocent, against people who don't deserve it, mostly women and children, right? You're acting literally out of evil. That's not what God's called us to be, right? Um, protecting women. Our job is to make sure women feel safe. That's our job. If you create an environment where women don't feel safe, you're wrong. If they don't feel safe around you physically, if they don't feel safe around your words, they think you're going to touch them, you're going to say something that makes them uncomfortable, you're just wrong. Don't do it. Okay? Um, you know, from physical harm, right? You know, that's the thing where um, if you're in a city, you walk on the outside of the sidewalk, right? So you're between the cars and her, things like that. Sleeping closer to the door in case a threat were to come in. Um, never hit a woman, right? Is that clear? Right? I think that's clear in this room. Better be. Never touching them inappropriately. Step in if you see a threat. And protecting them from emotional harm. Yelling, belittling, mocking, all those sort of things. Um, that's not our job either. We have to protect them from that. This idea of always being prepared, right? As men, we need to be what I call uh, situationally aware. We need to look, be aware of the situation. Um, when I went through my training, you're looking for the thing that's out of place, right? When that church shooting, that dude showed up in Texas, he was wearing a trench coat in the middle of summer. Mm -hmm. He still got in the building. He still got into the sanctuary. And some dude took him out, which is good, but why didn't they stop him outside? Hey, what's wrong? Why are you, you know, like, if something's out of place, it could be for a reason. As our job as men, we're supposed to be looking, have plans, be prepared to act in any situation. Now, I also think it's our job as men to know um, how to use guns, to know how to use knives, to know how to use weapons, to know how to use some hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'm not saying you need to be Bruce Lee or Rambo, but I am saying you need to have some basic knowledge and be prepared and ready to use those things if that situation were to arise. I also think... You need to be physically capable. Now, I know at different ages things happen and there's things like that. Um, but I do think whenever possible, we need to be physically capable. But if I'm 500 pounds as a 40-year-old man, I got a problem. Because I'm not going to be able to physically help in a situation where I should be. 
that's not the way, that's not what God's created us to be. Um, I also think it's important um, to de-escalate in any situation possible, right? We don't, just because we have a gun doesn't mean we should use the gun, right? Um, you know, I brought a knife with me, and in knife training, they teach you to do stuff like this. Hey, I don't want any trouble. What am I communicating? I'm communicating, I'll give you trouble if you want, if we have to do this, but I don't want to do it, right? But I'm gonna. That's our job. We have to know it, you have to be ready for it, okay? Because if you have a gun and you're not ready to use it, guess what, bad guy's gonna take it, they're gonna use it on you. And by the way, if you're not aggressive, you know who's always gonna be aggressive is the bad guys. You know, just because you are castrated, not saying you specifically, but if you were castrated because you were taught not to use violence, those bad guys don't care. And then they're going to overtake you and your women and your nation and look what's happening today. Be willing to handle the conflict. Talked about that already. And then self-sacrifice, obviously being willing to put yourself in that place. That's our job. Okay? That's what men are supposed to be. Um, now, been talking a lot about physical stuff. But most of us are not going to be in that situation. We're not going to be in a situation where I need to threaten a guy like, like this, right? Um, you know, warriors, yeah. But in every day, we're walking around a Viera, that's probably not going to happen. So why is this built into us? Why do we have this in us? Why do we have all this testosterone and this aggression? You know, there's a lot of reasons for it. But this idea of protection starts spiritually. Because there is a war going on, and we have an enemy who's trying to kill you and take out your family. And if you are not spiritually protecting your family before you do it physically, we can all say, oh, yeah, I'll get in front of a bus for my wife. But are you praying for her every day? Are you praying against darkness every day? Are you spiritually battling? That's our job as men. We have to be spiritual warriors before we can be physical warriors. Okay, number five. Almost done. Provision. Obvious, easy stuff here, right? As men, we know we got to take care of our wives, our families. It's our job, right? The Bible is very, very clear on this stuff. There's a lot of verses on it, so I'm going to keep moving here. Um, your family should live off what you earn, not what you and your wife earn together. Now, this is because you want to create an environment where she can choose to do what she wants. She can choose to stay home. She can choose to work. I'm not saying she has to stay home and make you a sandwich every day. If she wants to work, that's her freedom. And you are creating an environment where she can be whatever God's created her to be. But if you say, hey, honey, I, you have to do this for me, I don't think that's your job as a man. I think, you're not, I think we're missing it then. Um, her income should then go to things like non-budget items, extra payments on the house, saving up for a big vacation, you know, whatever. Because then if... She stops working for some reason. You know, we talk about this with young marrieds, right? Because then she gets pregnant. They two kids working together. And that was our problem. We were both working. And then she got pregnant. We wanted her to stay home. Half our salary got cut. You know, this was a problem. So, um, you know, if her income goes away, then your lifestyle doesn't change. And that's important. You're creating stability for your family. That's your job as a man. Um, even in dating, real men pay for stuff, right? Uh, learn, that means learning to mu manage your money well, right? This is the whole Financial Peace University stuff, all the Dave Ramsey stuff, living in a budget, tithing, not going into debt, actively communicating with your wife, setting financial goals together. You guys are working together on all this stuff. Planning for the future, investing wisely. The Bible talks about the wise man gives an inheritance to his children's children, right? Um, what a great thing for us all to strive for. Having the right insurance. This is something that's not talked about a lot, right? The right term life insurance, long-term disability, health insurance, vehicle insurance, all the stuff that you need, maybe for your business as well, right? I just had a hurricane, took me out for two and a half days. I pay for a fancy insurance that I pay for through the nose, and they denied my claim during Ian. I'm like, what am I paying for this for? And then like a week and a half later, you know, the, Nicole, right, she took me out. And I was able to, I'm going to get all that recouped now, right? So that's my job to provide for my family. Um, have a will all that stuff. And then, of course, knowing that whatever we do when we provide, all of our work is for Jesus, and we need to be living that way as if he is our master, not some human boss. Um, the dudes, I'm reminded of, um, what is it, Cousin Eddie from the Griswold Christmas mm -hmm. ring, right? Like, he's holding out for a management position, and right. Clark's like, for 12 years? <laughs> you, know, you know, that's idiocy, right? That's not what it's about, right? Um, we have to work hard. 
so many people give the minimum effort, guys. If you just go above and beyond, your chances are you're going to grow and have those opportunities uh, present to you. There's no perfect job. Right? It doesn't exist, um, but so we have to do the best with what we've got. Um, but we can't live in a fantasy world either. If, you're current, if you think, oh, well, God's called me into this job, and, but if you can't provide for your family, you've got a problem because God's called you to provide for your family. And that happened to me once um, where I was in a job where I couldn't provide for my family, and I was torn because I thought that was what God called me to do. But at the end of the day, I learned scripturally, God gives you one family. He gives you one wife. You can have any job you want, right? There's no biblical mandate that you have to do that thing. So I changed jobs. I changed careers. And God blessed it. Um, but if your job can't support it, it's your job to either find a new job or to get a second job or a third job or do whatever it takes because it's your job as a man to provide for your family. Now, are there times when it's okay to live under your wife's income? I think the answer is yes, but it would only be in a season where maybe, hey, I'm going to go get a different degree because, you know, that'll give me an opportunity to get more money. So for this 18 months, we're going to live under her income so that can do, it, you know, or something like that. Um, but it has to be mutually agreed. It has to be intentional. It has to be for a season. That's already dictated out before you decide to do it. She's never forced into it, right? That's important. As men, we don't force our wives to do anything. We create safe environments for them. All right, six. I hope, I hope you guys are staying with me. I'm going quick here. Um, responsibility. Right? As men, we have to be responsible. All of these areas. Be disciplined in your life. Time management. Right? I tell my, all my new hires, 15-year-old kids that show up for orientation, being late is one of the most selfish things you can do to others. Now, there are times when life happens, right? There's a train wreck. Or there's a, a, a highway thing. There's things that are out of your control. But if it's just because you can't manage your time, you're just communicating, I'm irresponsible and I'm selfish. Because what I'm doing is more important than my commitment to you. Okay, that's not what it means to be a man. Money management, we talked about that already. Um, physical management, being disciplined in sleep matters. Seven to eight hours matters, right? So I did the study where my goal is to wake up at 6.30 a.m. Well, that means I have to be in bed, lights out, at 10.30. Well, that means I need to be like showered by 9.30, right? Like, and you keep tracking it back until you figure out what you need to do, right? You have to be responsible um, with your sleep. You have to be responsible with what you eat. You have to be responsible with exercise. I think that's a part for all of our lives. Um, don't get drunk. Don't use illicit drugs. These are basic things that the Bible talks about. I don't think the Bible says you shouldn't drink alcohol. I do think the Bible is very clear about getting drunk, right? So I have a rule in my life. Um, I won't have more than two in a day, right? If I have a drink, maybe if I have two, one's good for me. I don't really care about alcohol very much. But if I have two in a day, I'm done. I don't care where I am. I don't care what the situation is because I never want to get to a point where I get drunk, right? That's what the Bible says. So we have to be responsible as men. We have to avoid addictions. Guys, there's a lot of addictions out there. It's not just pornography. Drugs, alcohol, smoking, food is an addictive thing. Video games, caffeine's addictive. TV's addictive. These stupid phones are addictive. Like, there's a lot of things that are out there. And I'm not saying avoid it all and live like the Amish. What I am saying is there's certain right and wrong, and you know you. You know your temptations, right? And the Bible tells us um, that he who knows what to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. There are things that are sinful, right? Pornography is bad. Stay away from it. Right? But I'm not saying caffeine is sinful and you shouldn't do it, but if you're ad addicted to it, anything that you need in life over Jesus, I think is bordering with, with sin and you need to evaluate that in your life. Um, holding yourself accountable. Some people blame other people, right? Oh, well, if that guy didn't do this or this guy, no, you're a man. If there's something wrong in your life, fix it. Right? That's your job as a man. If you don't, don't complain, don't make excuses, it's probably your fault. There's probably something in you you don't like anyway and that's what you're complaining about. So as a man, evaluate yourself and fix it because you're the only one who can, who can fix you. Right? Okay. Seven. Almost done. Anybody want to guess? Nope. Good. It's okay. Leadership, right? God calls men to be leaders. Right? This is very clear all over Scripture. Um, so I'm not going to go into all this stuff. But because he called us to be leaders, he's given us the ability to lead through him. 
He also has given the expectation that we use our positions and skills for his glory and not to abuse others. Right? There are men out there who abuse others. There are men out there who hurt women. There's a lot of broken people out there because men are abusing this. That's not what God's called us to be. So leading our family, right? You decide the health of the environment you want. Um, so I like this picture here, right? You're the gardener. Are you creating a safe greenhouse in which everybody can flourish? Or are you a dictator that's snuffing everybody out? Right? That's your job. That's not the mom's job. That's not the wife's job. That's your job. Are you initiating healthy dialogue, making decisions together in your family? Um, you know, I never make any decision independent of my wife. We talk together and we make decisions together. And if there's a stalemate, it's the man's job to make that decision. Right? If you can't figure it out, then the man has to make that decision. But if you're pursuing Jesus, you're probably going to make the right decision. If you're not, probably not. Um, I've, I've interviewed a lot of kids, thousands of kids. The best kids that work for me and the best kids I've seen in the world have parents who genuinely live out their values. Right? As Christians, if you say Christ matters, but you're not living it out, if you say Christ matters, but you're getting drunk all the time, or you're yelling and swearing at your kids, or you know, you're not treating your wife properly, or you know, kids can sniff out hypocrites. And um, that Jesus isn't going to honor that. We, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard and set that example. Um, we also need to intervene when we see something, just like danger, physical danger. If I see my kids involved in uh, internet things that are not good, I need to say something, right? Unrestricted internet access is one of the most dangerous things you can do. All these social media things that are out there, and I know a lot of you guys have grown up kids that are, you know, this is irrelevant to you, but this is a teaching for men, like all men, and so I need you to understand, you know, where I'm coming from here. Um, don't be naive to the dangers that are out there, because again, we have an enemy who's trying to destroy our families, and it's our job to intervene. It's our job to step in and say no, and to set standards, okay? Because we have to lead. We have to lead our families. Um, so many men don't take initiative in life. Right? The Bible says that without vision, the people perish. You have to have a clear picture of the future. That's one of the things I talk about with leadership is seeing into the future, seeing something that other people can't see, and then saying, come along. We're going to do it together. Right? That's our job as men for our families, for your businesses, whatever organizations, wherever you have influence, you have to be able to see a clear picture of the future. Um, but if not, if you don't take initiative, like you're not fulfilling your purpose as a man. And you have to learn to be decisive. decisive. Again, that's another thing I think that our culture has just taken away from men. Right? Um, we have to pray for wisdom in our decisions. We have to be confident in our decisions and in our relationship with Christ and in who we are. As I've grown in my relationship with Christ, the decisions that I make become more clear. How I see the world becomes more clear. And I can learn to do things that I used to hesitate about but I don't anymore because I know this is what Jesus wants me to be, right? Um, big, big deals here, guys. And then decisions with your wife. We talked about that. Never making anything without her. Not leaving all the decisions to her, right? Oh, you just do it. You just do it. You just do it. That's not honoring to her, right? That's not leadership. We work together. Um, and just because your wife has a different role than you doesn't mean she's less valuable. Don't think of your wife as less than. She's just different, right? Um, difference just different. It's not worse. It's not one's not better than the other. So I think that's important that we talk about as well. Um, all right. So that's the that's the kind of the concept, guys. And then you know I want to come back uh -huh. to this idea of stumbling forward. These are ideals to strive towards, right? We're never going to arrive. None of us. But I think it's our job as men to push towards all seven of these all the time. If I'm doing six really well and I've given up on one, I'm failing as a man, biblically, right? If I just give up on all of them, I've obviously very much failed. The idea is for the rest of our lives, we're always evaluating ourselves, we're always striving, and always kind of clawing um, to these ideals that Jesus has called us to be. I think this is what he wants us to do. And I have a verse here, um, Ephesians 4.1, where it says what Paul said, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Right? This is the calling. This is what I think Jesus has called us to be as men. Um, and so this is what I want to share with you guys. So I'm going to stop here. And now I want you to genuinely tell me everything I said wrong. <laughs> because I need to hear this. Because I need to know if Jesus is giving this to me to give to people, I need to know if I'm off base here. So um, you, this is your time. Tell me what I did wrong. Or what you agree with. Or what, you know, anything. I think we 
nailed it. Okay. I think it's a great blueprint. I, I think also, realistically, um, it's a tough one to maintain. But obviously, we're up to the challenge because somebody's done it. But it's, yeah, it's being, a, being the leader of a family is not easy. But, um, but I do believe, like, the roles, you know, as far as his. What, what what God, God has given it. us, we, we need to do our best with it. There's so many people I know in this community and in this world that I've heard these stories about. If they would have done this, their lives would be different. Their families would be different. Their daughters wouldn't be scarred. Their boys wouldn't be insecure, right? How many men are just absent because they're not doing this? I don't think it really it came up directly in your presentation, but uh, I know a lot of uh, Christians in my age, um, uh, every, every week I talk to them, and they do these things, and then the kids still are teenagers mm -hmm. growing into young adults, doing the things that teenagers growing into young adults do. Um, I'm not sure that makes you a failure if that happens, if you were trying. Um, but, I mean, that, that's realistically what's happening in our world now. I mean, a lot, a lot of good, Christ-loving friends of mine, contemporaries, have struggled with this. There, there are issues that I've seen and observed. Um, we've dealt with issues with our kids. There's at one point our oldest son, um, who I'm going to pick on John here, he, he was, uh, at the time, when my kid, my oldest, was like 10 or 12, he was the youth pastor at our church. And we thought he was going to go to jail, like this kid was just doing all sorts of stuff. And I called John, I'm like, John, what do I do? You're the youth pastor. And I don't know if you remember this, John, he literally said, man, I don't know, we're kind of watching you guys. Because <laughs> our kids were older than his kids. And I'm like, <laughs> um, you know, praying for wisdom, and I think this whole like initiation leadership thing and protection thing, I saw my son doing stuff that was not what he needed to be doing. So I prayed for wisdom and figured out what am I supposed to do here, and I intervened. I stepped in and I said, no, this is going to stop, and I will go to whatever lengths possible I need to to, to get you back. Um, including, we found out he was doing some bad stuff with some boys in the church group, and we found out the day before they were supposed to go to church camp. I pulled him from church camp. I made my son not go to church camp, and I sent him to a different camp all by himself, where he couldn't be with all of his church friends, and he missed all the whitewater rafting, and all the memories, and all the songs, and all the unity, and everything. And he hated it. He was so upset, and he thought I was bluffing until we got in the car. And we drove all the way across the state to his other camp, and I said, bye. And that, I think that was the most pivotal moment in his life that changed who he was. And I'm not saying yay me, I'm saying that I took the initiative to step in and say this won't stop. And I would go to any length to save him from that. And I, I, I don't know the situations you're talking about, of course. Um, every situation is different. And uh, one of the other things that I've learned in life is that you are not responsible for other people. You can say and do anything you want in the world and put every parameter in place, and they'll still break it, right? And that doesn't make you a failure. Everybody's responsible for them. You, know, you can't control other people. You know, all you can do is your best. I like the example you gave in your experience where you pretty much demonstrated to them that you're going to do anything, yeah. but still in love, you're not going to make them your enemy. That's right. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the fine line you're treading. Because you can... You can you can become over disciplinary because you need your will to happen and guide it further. So I mean, it's 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 a challenge. That's why it's impossible to do without Christ. Yeah. You can't you can't do it right without Christ. Two things, Mike. <clears throat> you talk about being the aggressor for being a man, but I think one of the things as men we can miss out on and should have as much passion for is being a prayer warrior for our family. Because that's a cornerstone that then dictates how we react when things come up. And I think you put a lot of emphasis on that, as well as uh, being courageous to have tough conversations. I think Christian families pull the punches when it comes to talking about sex, about what it means to be a man in a relationship, about how a young man's conducting himself 
with the young one. I mean, if they don't hear that early on, and, and more importantly, they don't see that demonstrated at home, that then, you know, I was like you, I had no parents, I had no supervision. I didn't know how to conduct myself. Mm -hmm. So I got in a lot of safe places that, you know, you could to, to realize, hey, that was completely wrong. Yeah. But I think you have to have courage to have the tough conversations and get in love and wisdom. It's good. Because there's things you can say to drive the kids apart versus things you can say, as you said, that can de escalate or, or bring together. Mm -hmm. I think creating an environment with divisiveness is not tolerated, but an open conversation with being frank. One of my favorite, I, I try to receive a lot of wisdom. I pray for a lot of wisdom. And Scott here actually has been one of those people that's provided a lot of wisdom for me. One of my favorite things you've ever said about parenting was whenever your kids want to talk, stop. Stop whatever you're doing and listen. Doesn't matter if it's one in the morning till three in the morning. You stay there and you be with those kids to receive because you want to build that relationship and open that up. Um, and so I've been grateful for a lot of your counsel. Thank you. The greatest ability is your availability. I think one of the things, and I don't know if somewhere in your talk I missed it or whatever, but I think it's really important that you and your wife at least pray together or if you don't have devotions together. Yeah. Um, that helps keep a good relationship between the two of you. And I have to tell you this from, from my personal experience was I never realized for a long time how much my mom was praying for me every day. Mm -hmm. So after she passed away, there's something missing. My support's not enough. You know, yeah. It was, um, but it's important that, you know, she told me one time, she said, I know you're okay. You're following Christ. She said, I don't have to pray for you as much as I do your brother and my sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, okay, I'll take That's that. That's good. I appreciate it. Kind of a backhanded, you know. Yeah. But, but anyway, I think it's important that you, you're praying for your kids every day and you pray with them and mm -hmm. for your wife every That's day. That's good. I appreciate that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Maybe I missed it too. Because um, there's a lot covered here. There's a lot of information. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I find most helpful, I learned it a long time ago, um, with my kids, my wife, as a, as a supervisor, manager, in the leadership role, whatever, um, is to say, hey, I screwed up, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I have said it so many times to my kids. Um, when I made the decision, I said, you know, I, I thought it was the right decision. It may have been the right decision, but delivered in the wrong manner. Uh -huh. um, whatever the case may be, and it, it's hard to do as a guy because we're supposed to just, you know, suck it up. But I find it goes a long way. Yeah. Um, in every area of life. Yeah. That's good. And I think you hit the nail on the head. With number one being Christ. Um, I think sometimes after we move on to number one, you focus on humility, honor, protection, which is all valuable. I would just throw Christ-like humility, Christ-like honor. Because um, that's our focus. We're never going to do any of those well. Our pursuit is to do those perfectly, but we're not. Which is why we lean on Christ. And I think even though what you shared is, as a dad, I'm never going to be a perfect father. And I tell my daughter and son that quite often. I say, listen, I'm going to screw up. But man, know that you have a perfect father. He's never going to screw up. He's never going to be me. And as a dad, I'm just... I want to do all I can to represent God well to my kids. And so I think this is all good, but I think as you've heard from feedback, when they see humility, they're going to define it one way, but if you throw Christ-like in front of that, they're going to be okay. I see what you're saying. And you've done that, but I think... No, it's good. I wrote it down. Thank you. It's good. Is there anything I missed on any of your cards? Anything that you guys wrote in the beginning? Come up specifically, but I'd just be interested in your opinion because I thought about this and, and I thank God I've never had to experience it. But what if one of your kids came to you and told you that they were either gay or not the right gender? And how, how do you handle that immediately then over time as well? Yeah, I don't know. I've not been there yet, right? Um, so, right. No, and I know a guy at my church who's had that same experience. Um, I, I think 
you, we pray for wisdom, right? You pray for wisdom and that Jesus shows you how to handle that situation more than what your instant anger or, you know, you're wrong or you're screwed up or, you know, whatever. Um, I, my daughter is in a school where all she hears about is negative stuff. So like politically, she just is influenced by all that and, and we hear it come out and stuff. And she made a comment once that uh, Ron DeSantis is one of the most hated people in America. And I said, what are you talking about? Right? Like, because I love the guy, like he's been amazing. Um, and so we have to be careful with the, what influences our kids. And so we actually have talked about that. We've prayed about it, my wife and I, and we've just, you know, what are we gonna do here? Um, so we're gonna, we schedule a time with her to talk through what are these political things and what does that mean? And not try to like influence her, but to share truth. And as Christians, how are we supposed to look at this so that we aren't allowing her to be influenced just by the world Right, because that could be in politics, it could be in the gender thing, and, and all that stuff. Um, and so she knows we're going to have that conversation, and we're going to get it scheduled. We were supposed to do it, but because of the hurricane, you know, everything went to crap. Um, and you know, we're going to have a, a very safe conversation where she can learn and have those opportunities to, you know, feel safe and, and talk about difficult things. I think it sounds like one of the main things is you've established a long-standing line of communication with your family, and I think that. That has to be an asset. One of the things um, that you said, my daughter told me, she was like, Dad, when you, you know, yell or whatever, because I used to yell at my kids and um, they would get scared and cry. And she said, like, we don't want to be around that. Like, it needs to change. And she was like 14 or something at the time. And she was right. And it took me some time to, like, process that and, you know, get over my own pride and say, well, why is she right? And I'm, you know, I know how to handle this. And. Um, but I had to, I made changes in how I engaged my kids. And then I went back and told her, I said, you changed me. Like I was wrong and you were right. And I'm grateful for your influence. And that did so much to grow our relationship. Um, like it's been tremendous. Um, just, just listening and, and admitting when I was wrong. Can we get a round of applause for Mike?